Great. Okay. So hello everyone and welcome to our second Next Museum I.O. Meet, meet up on mapping the cartographic from collective rewilding. My name is Alina and I'm the project manager of Next Museum I.O. So if you have any questions um, or feedback regarding our platform, other open calls or events, you can just uh, contact me. I will put um, my email address in the, in the chat. And before we start, just the hint for you that we will record the session um, for those ones who can't make it today and will watch the replay. So if you don't want to be visible, just turn off your camera and um, you'll be fine. And also please turn off your, your microphone while the others are talking. Great, uh, so Sarah, Sabina and uh, Amelie, uh, I would say the stage is yours. Thank you, Alina. Uh, hello everyone once again. I'm going to share a presentation with you. Uh, so you will have something to look at while I'm talking. Um, so I am uh, Sabina and I'll be uh, hosting and moderating our meeting today. Um, I would like to welcome you all to our second meetup. And first of all, I would also like to thank, thank everyone for joining this meeting and also thank Next Museum and Alina for organizing and hosting it. Um, I'm, yeah, as I said, Sabina from the Collective Rewilding. Uh, however, the entire team is here uh, today with us. So hello, Amelie and hello, Sara. Uh, make sure to, you know, um, pose your questions if you have any questions in the chat and the two of them are going to take care of the questions. Um, so today's agenda. Um, this is our second meetup. Some of you have maybe missed the first one. Uh, you can find the link for the first meetup in the, in the website, our website, the website of Next Museum or on, uh, on our Instagram. We have several things that we want to discuss today. Uh, first and foremost is uh, to give you a short uh, for, uh, feedback on the open call submissions, because this has been a question that has been uh, arriving every now and then on our uh, Telegram group and also on our email. Uh, we also want to give uh, some details about the venue of the exhibition, about our host, Drugo More, and the DM gallery. And we have also presented, uh, decided to uh, give a chance to some of the artists to present their work. So we will have three uh, artist talks uh, today. Joining us are Imandato, Mateusz Montanari, and Monica Dodniak. Uh, after we finish with the artist talks, the idea is to have a short Q&A uh, session. And again, if we manage to uh, do it with the time, that is, um, we, we want to be done in like an hour. So if we have the time, we will then address the questions. If not, we would keep the questions and address them in the following weeks on our Telegram group. So we can start with open call submissions. Um, as you might have already seen on our Instagram, our website, or the website of Next Museum IO, uh, through the open call, we have received over 150 submissions. Uh, and we are very grateful for all the work that you shared with us. Uh, this work that you submitted uh, gave us a lot of interesting new narratives and ways of addressing uh, the, the, the stigma of the exhibition. And uh, it is also very important for us to let you know how until now we have not made any decisions regarding the final selection. Uh, so the plan is to have the final list of artists who will be joining the exhibition by the end of this month. So basically by the end of uh, March, we will uh, hopefully have uh, the final list of artists who are joining the exhibition. Um, many of you were asking this, so let me just shortly address the question. Um, we have been featuring some of the submitted works uh, on our Instagram, on our uh, website as well, and we also have three artists who are presenting here today. Um, they are only selected as their work shows the variety of ways uh, the, the topic of the exhibition was addressed. Um, so uh, we selected them to, to present today, uh, but this doesn't mean that they have you know, made the cut and how they're uh, joining the, the final exhibition. Um, other than that, um, 
it is very important uh, to let you know how the plan is to select 10 to 15 artworks, depending on, uh, of course, on how big and complex the works are, uh, and also having in mind uh, the budget that we have for the exhibition. We are at the moment in the process of uh, fundraising for the exhibition, and uh, this will be, of course, uh, playing a major role in the final production of the show. So once again, thank you everyone for submitting your works. Um, just one second, what's happening? So thank you everyone for submitting your works and uh, yeah, just stay uh, patient uh, while we finish our selection. The details of the, of the venue. Um, this is a very exciting moment uh, for us because we have partnered up with Drugo More, which in English means the other sea. Um, and our partner for this show is uh, based in Rijeka in Croatia. And I will use this time to shortly introduce them. So Drugo More is a nonprofit organization from Croatia that is working since 1999. Um, and they are very interesting because they identify and explore topics of social relevance and general interest to the local community. Uh, which makes us very happy to partner with them, as this is in the core of our curatorial discourse. Um, Drugo Mora is working locally, uh, but also uh, regionally and internationally with an idea of showing interdisciplinary work uh, and uh, with the name of a connecting artistic program with discourses in so uh, science and cultural theory. Um, Drugo Mora, in a way, believes uh, that art is an important cognitive tool, and their program is aimed at addressing this. They're uh, creating and uh, facilitating an exchange between the local and international um, community. They uh, always host a lot of uh, artists, students, and um, at the core of their uh, activity is the production of visual and performing arts and research in the field of culture as well as organizational participatory and educational events such as conferences and events. So now that you have an idea of who Drugo More is, we can also talk about the gallery. So uh, on the picture, you can see the building where the, gal where the gallery is uh, located. Uh, the gallery has two names, so don't be confused. It is either Gallery DM, which is Drugo More, or Galleria Filodramatica. Filodramatica, uh, the Galleria or Gallery Filodramatica is due to the fact that the building itself is called Filodramatica. And um, so in a way, it's always the same space, but it has two different names. Uh, the building is a 19th century neoclassical building that is actually a very important uh, national heritage site for, for uh, uh, Rijeka. Uh, they have been working, Drugo Mora has been working within the Philodramatica Gallery since 2002, and uh, they have organized a number of shows, events, um, conferences and seminars, you can take a look at their website. It is a very big and impressive um, list of names uh, that you can find there. Uh, I just, you know, wrote uh, several artists who you can see on the list who presented their works there. But what I find very interesting and what uh, works well with us is the fact that they do a lot of collaborations with curators and they are not um, um, unfamiliar with working uh, in collaboration with curators, guest curators who come to the gallery and work on the on site. Um, here I presented, I, I, I put some names of the uh, curators who collaborated with uh, Gallery DM already. And, you know, we all love superstars. So you can also see who are the big superstars who presented their works in the uh, Drugo More Gallery in the past, uh, let's say, 19 years already, wow, that's impressive. Um, here is the gallery plan. So this, when you see the plan of the gallery, you can then um, kind of understand why we cannot choose more than 10 to 15 works. It is a total of 93, um, uh, square meters. Uh, uh, the gallery floor, uh, plan is 93 square meters, but you can see that the left wall is uh, opened. And if you take this uh, floor plan and, you know, look at the, the picture above, all of these windows are actually one wall of the, of the gallery. So that means that we are 
either losing one wall or if we have a nice budget, then we can, you know, add a lot of interesting things and, and create new niches in the, in the gallery. Um, I also prepared a number of pictures of different exhibitions that were hosted by the DM gallery so that you can have an idea of how, what are the possibilities of, of the gallery. So here uh, is the, the empty gallery the, without anything in it. Um, it's a very nice space, very clean uh, with, as you can see, a lot of windows that can be covered and used in many different ways. This is an exhibition that was organized in 2016, I think. Um, it is uh, an exhibition called Yesterday is Cancelled, Tomorrow is Irreversible by Oliver, uh, Oliver Ressler. Um, as you can see, they use the, the space uh, for a lot of uh, video uh, projections. Um, later, you have interesting installations that can be uh, organized in the in the space. So here we have the installation Who Does What of, of Silvio LaRusso. And um, here I actually took this picture, but I'm not sure what the exhibition is, but it just shows you how not only um, one people shows uh, solo exhibitions or, or big installations can take place here. Uh, this is a group show and um, it is, um, important to understand how even in group shows and group exhibitions, every artist, every work gets it. <laughs> nice. No, no, no. Okay. Um, this is another, just uh, an interesting picture to see uh, of uh, what the uh, production possibilities of the gallery are. And last, this is an exhibition that just opened uh, this month, uh, last month. Um, and again, it's a, it's a big show that um, is called uh, the Red School, uh, and it's it's a it's a historical um, it's a historical exhibition. But you can see how the windows are covered, uh, and these uh, new curtains are actually part of the exhibition. So uh, that is about the gallery and our collaboration with Drugo More. And what we have planned for you next is uh, the artist talks. Um, but before we get there, uh, I hope that this little short, short presentation on, on the gallery made you uh, a little bit more excited about the show. It sure made me excited because I feel like with the, with the space, we have a lot of possibilities and it, go, it is going to, um, create create a lot of new uh, ways of showing works. Uh, so um, in the next part, we're going to have uh, Iman Dato, Matius Montanari and Monica Doniak uh, present their work. Uh, we decided to give them the opportunity to present as we feel like their work uh, shows three very, very interesting positions um, and ways of looking at the open call questions. Uh, for example, example, Iman is looking at cartography from a non-human perspective. Um, Mateus is giving us a very interesting research on how how cartography can be made. Uh, and, and finally, uh, Monica is using mapping as a tool to address uh, intergenerational trauma. So um, that is uh, all from me. I now invite Iman to start her presentation. And of course, uh, everyone else who is in this meetup, uh, if you have any questions during the, the presentations, just uh, share them in the chat. Thanks, Sabina. I'll just share my screen now. Okay, so hi, my name is Iman. I'm an architectural researcher and spatial storyteller. And today I'll give a short introduction into my practice. Canomic Botany, which is a parallel botanical institution. We explore the many methods of map making that exist beyond our human centric depiction of worlds to ask what happens if we represent space, not relative to the human, but relative to one another. Our ongoing project, freeing the potato from its scientific and colonial ties, uses map making to challenge and destabilize the way we categorize, order, and arrange plants in the botanical garden. But why the potato? So the potato, a colonized specimen, is subject to a typical hero story. It was a reward reaped by conquistador Francisco Pizarro on his exhibition to Peru in search for gold. 
But in that journey, the significance of the plant as a whole was erased, as the nuances and knowledge systems that surround it. The result, a spread of potatoes emerging from a narrow genetic bottleneck and a nomenclature to represent our movements across territories, borders, and bodies, as shown by this early research map, illustrating the use of spaces in economy and ecology to alter the inertness and agency of certain beings and bodies and create the distinction between human and non-human. So despite there existing thousands of names of and, and their names of the potato, we have reduced this to just 50 domestic varieties in the Western world. Our domesticated language unable to ascertain the potato seeds teaching of survival through variety and difference. A pursuit of progress time relationships has resulted in the loss of knowledge of old practices in relation to cyclical time. This drawing, for instance, shows the seasons of potato, potato cultivation according to cosmology and Andean rituals. Meanwhile, here is a 14 year cycle of creating a new cultivar in laboratories to achieve the perfect French fry. But now it is time to re-remember, I am more than my tuber. I'm also my seed, my flower, my fruits and my roots. So indigenous botanists and cartographers practiced long before these sciences became pol political tools to advance a singular mode of thinking that placed the human at the center of its worldview. The Economic Botanical Garden acknowledges the malleability of botany and cartography to go beyond empirical truth and reason, recognizing that maps of tactile, cosmographic, visual, mnemonic, and other forms are used around the world to disseminate a more tacit reading of scale, time, and place. So now I'll take you on a little immersive experience, and with this pot, we'll find a portal from Q into the site of the Economic Botanical Garden following the potato into a power amorphous landscape device to cultivate new map making practices centered around a ceramic vessel which defines the garden's spatial and social arrangement we work gradually outwards to grapple with four fundamental questions posed by the potato and our seed cartographer will, will respond with a series of artifacts that defy cartesian map making principles of drawn immersive tactile and oral qualities just to name a few One, who are my friends? You have placed me in the family called Solanarche, using the tree of life as a symbol to match me with other plants that share the same anatomical features, governing how you organize your order beds, such as this one in Q. But if I were to be placed with my family, we would fight for nutrients and spread disease. Notice how here in the economic botanical garden, Channels are marked not by trees, but by rhizomatic structures, as symbols of my intertangled relationships between kin. I have found my place amongst the soil and the earth, rooted comfortably beside lettuce and spinach, sharing a network of nutrients with corn and green bean. I'm aware of a potato beetle hovering north of my territory, but the catnip, coriander and tansy managed to stop the contaminant. The woody scent of sage and the leaves of nasturtium act as a magnet to the aphids and the lady bird in, in the southwestern zone diverts their attention away from me. I have explored my contaminants and collaborations to develop a new categorization system by kinship and personality traits, sorting plants into roles of compassion, protection, intelligence and foundation. We reveal how these kinship ties contradict groupings of the plant tree of life and uncover the multiple ways of ordering nature. Two, where are the wild ones? You have a good understanding of alpine wilderness, the tough, hardy plants that grow above the tree line and below the snow line in temperate zones, marked by distinct seasonal changes. These are the environments you attempt to mimic back home, emulating their form and landscape in miniature rock gardens, such as this one at Kew. World of wild alpine plants is known in Maine, but have you heard of my home, the Paramo? I'm one of 234 wild ancestors of Solum tuberosa. Here in Paramo, we are not known for our flowery flesh, but our brightly coloured flowers, transported by a carriage in the spiky pollen sacs of the Bombus robustus. 
Here, I take root in multiple ecosystems, such as the high grasslands of Cusco, nestled beneath the queen of the Andes, sheltered from days which feel like the hottest of summers and nights the harshest of winters. I thrive in soil types that are black and saturated, but also dry and xerophytic, taking root in the sandy clay soil with Coriocactus sedicea, in the canyons of the Anco Cunca, and at the edges of field borders and forgotten agricultural terraces. I cling to the side of mountain tops in the highest of altitudes in carpet-like mats with stipa ichi. We may not be tasty, but we are tough. Here we shift scale to meet eyes with my grandfathers in the Paramo, to explore how external environmental conditions influence plant anatomy and disease resistance. Instead of producing botanical illustrations that map plant physical and morphological features, we draw soil types, atmosphere, light intensity, among other features that influence my diverse set of mechanisms for disease control. So those are just two of many questions posed by the potato within the virtual world of canomic botany. The other maps that exist, such as the one on the screen, can be explored by my entry on the mapping the cartographic site. So to summarize, canomic botany is an educational resource that in its process of construction asks us to embrace the contradictions of living in multiple worlds. To enter the canomic botanical garden, defies empirical knowledge, allowing for numerous readings, times and memories to occur in one dreamscape or world. The maps communicate like stories, as tools to offer a sense of the memory codes outside of one's own immediate environment. Unlike you, the economic botanical garden is an indeterminate body with no end, boundary or border. The landscape will continue to mutate in two ways. One, it adapts through the extension of existing channels, relying on multiple authorship to extend outwards. So collaborative ways of working with communities, artists, architects, ethnographers, and the institution and the public will, will, um, will establish the support networks required to extend this living resource through workshops and public events. Two, it goes through, through the introduction of new nodes. So from the potato, we could expand our attention to a material such as rubber or to a disease or a particle, connecting further sites in queue to a set of new pots in the landscape and channels that overlap and intersect. So to reiterate, what is important here is not to create a finished and archived set of artifacts or objects in the landscape, but a generative resource that encourages and learns from the multiple channels for recording human relationships to nature with hope to make room for more sustainable practices within and beyond botanical institutions. And we have a series of workshops coming up soon. So please do make sure to follow us on our Instagram at Economic Botany to take a look at how to take part in those if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. This was really, really good. Um, just one second, what happened here? Uh, next, we have Mateusz with the algorithmic uh, landscape presentation. Hello. So just share my screen with you, just a second. Okay, is it working? Yes, okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank the collective Rewilding and the Next Museum for the invitation and for the organizing these meetups. Uh, I think this kind of action really opens up the experience, experience of the curating process. And I'm really happy to be part of it somehow. Um, so I will be presenting a project that's called Algorithmic Landscapes. And to summarize very briefly, this project proposes to investigate the algorith algorithmic dimension of the landscape, uh, subverting artificial intelligence algorithms in order to create poetic content. So what that really means, hopefully, will be clear by the end of my talk. Um, 
So a little context about myself. Uh, my name is Matheus Montanari. I am an artist from Brazil and I work with art and technology. Uh, I'm a member of the Digital Poetics Research Group that is coordinated by Gilberto Prado, who is also my advisor. Uh, and I'm just starting my PhD at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, where I also did my master's. And this project is actually part of my master's work. Uh, and besides that, I have a bachelor's degree in digital technology. Um, and I also studied uh, for a period in the fine arts faculty of Lisbon in Portugal. So that's my background and where this interest from uh, art and technology comes from. Um, and now I will be discussing a few concepts and main topics about the work. And then in the last part, I will talk about the most practical part of it and the process of making it. So what is the landscape? Uh, usually uh, when we think about landscape, we think about something that's a bit far away, uh, something that we can observe, maybe a beautiful beach or a mountain or a painting or even a background where something takes place on. Uh, but that's absolutely not what I'm talking about in this project at all. Um, I'm borrowing the landscape concept from uh, of Tim Ingold. Um, and he says that the landscape is not a background where the action takes place, uh, much the opposite. The landscape itself, it's something in the order of action. And to explain it a, a little bit better, but I'm not sure how useful it will be. I made this drawing that you can see in the screen. Um, so in the, in the landscape, as I've summarized, we have three main elements. That's the space, time, and actors, um, represented here by the letter A. So uh, each actor has a different vector T for time. Uh, and for example, one of these actors could be the weather, which changes from time to time. Another actor could be the mountains, which also change, but at a geological temporal scale, it's much different from ours. Um, so another actor could be us, you know, people. And finally, another one could be a technological one, as such as the algorithms, which operate in a very fast um, velocity. So for an easier picture, when I talk about algorithms here, we can imagine any GPS application that traces and suggested routes. And so all of these actors acting are creating agency in this network. And they are affecting each other at the same time that they are being affected by them. So space is not closed or crystallized it is constantly actualizing itself. So that's the landscape in action always becoming. Um, and we, with this approach, we intend to get out of the dichotomous relationship of nature, culture or technology nature. And we want to embrace an ecology that is also an ecology of machines as in Yukui. So Yuki Hui proposes that in the world we live today, uh, to think about biodiversity is not sufficient anymore. And we need to also think about techno-diversity or even better techno-diversities in the plural. Um, so, uh, well, obviously technology has a global aspect to it that, that's really important and very connective. Uh, but where we are failing, according to Hui, and I agree, is in exploring the local qualities of technology, its usage and impact. Uh, moreover, Hui asks, what would be the decolonized scenario of technology today if each civilization had the opportunity to develop its own technology instead of adopting a hegemonic system? 
So the algorithmic landscape project goes in this direction. It applies the same algorithmic methodology in two different uh, cities that are Paris in France and Caxias do Sul in Brazil, which is my hometown. Uh, so this project proposes a different way to explore and map the city by a psychocartographic experimental and algorithmic de, uh, derive. And, and this project consists of three iterative stages that I will be presenting in the, the next slides. So the first part um, of the work consists of a performance where I do an algorithm, algorithmic derive in two different cities, Paris and Caxias do Sul. And in both cities, I follow the same methodology, subverting a music suggestion algorithm into a road tracer. So I start walking and listening to the suggested playlist. And if the algorithm is right and suggests me a song that I like, I turn the next uh, corner right. And if it's wrong and suggests me a song which I don't like, I turn the next corner left. And during the course of this action, I make a time lapse of the way and I record everything in the GPS application. After doing that in both cities, I take each frame of the time lapse and I pass them through another artificial intelligence system. Uh, this time, one that I created specifically for this work. And what the systems uh, do does is that they, uh, it takes the images of one city and searches for the most similar in the other city. So this way, we force the algorithm to create an approximation between these two geographical and social distant places. With these pairs of images, we print them in acrylic sheets where the pigment doesn't dry completely um, so then we can join uh, the image of the different cities. And because the pigment is not completely set and the acrylic sheet is transparent, we can see the image that emerged between these two places. And that's what we call the algorithmic landscape, as you can see here. Uh, with these images, we are able to create several works and ways of exhibiting them. Uh, we worked with video, uh, with a video mapping in, the, in a building facade. We also developed an interactive installation and even our web art piece, where a browser extension makes intervention in specific websites. So one thing that I like about this project is that it gives us the opportunity to change for each time it's going to be exhibited. Um, so basically, that's it. I know uh, it's a lot of different process, but if you're interested in learning more about it, there's a video essay in the collective Instagram page that explains more detail, with more detail. Um, and that's it. Um, you're welcome to get in touch with me, and that's my website and my email. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was really interesting. Um, then we have Monica next. Thank you, Sabina. Thank I'm you. also going to start my presentation. Oh. Um, thank you for the introduction and opportunity to present my work. In my short presentation, I would like to talk about my project, past pieces merging with what I call now. This project consists of a short film and wearable sculpture and a written piece of work. As in most of my works, this piece is not only an assemblage of different media, but also a result of a multidisciplinary and multi-layered research. This combines my personal biography with my interdisciplinary research in psychology, philosophy, and natural sciences. In my work, I'm interested in the wide range of cartographies. This goes from the microscopic levels, such as the first forms of life and the sea that we evolved from, 
to the macroscopic level, such as geopolitical borders that are artificially defining the concept of a nation. I'm specifically interested in the way that throughout history, non-human and human agents have become subject to marginalization and were forced into certain forms of violent contracts that our recent society and our environment is still built on. This is something that also I'm looking at uh, the political theorist Angela Mitropoulos writes in her book, Contract and Contagion, which I'm very interested in. In this context, I'm interested how those past cartographies that were separating people into categories have led to the inequalities that we are still facing today. This is, for example, something that many people refer to as in capitalism, but to clarify, I also want to refer here to the concept of capitalism that has not first arose with the industrialization, but already the time of witch hunt, as Sylvia Federici claims. As a Polish-German artist, I'm using uh, my biographical material that has been passed on to me through various generations. Many of my ancestors had come partially from Lithuania, Ukraine, Belarus, and have fled, fled to Poland, but also from the German side, have experienced war and displacement. I perceive my whole body as a collection of maps that are fluid in their existence, but are also party, part, partially uh, turned into stagnated forms, such as in the example of trauma. In 2012, I've started my research in psychology and neurology, which further led to my research and uh, work with dancers. With the discovery of neurons, as from the scientist Ramon E. Cajal in the 19th century, we have until today learned that our whole body is a versatile and ch constantly changing network that stores memories. However, such a network also stores negative memories or in other, uh, in other words, also trauma. This can be inherited over the generations and lead to nightmares, fears, anxieties and generations to come. In my work, past pieces merging with what I call now, which I developed in 2020, I invited my friend and performer, Susanna Ritz, to interpret my score and research. My work with performers is another form of mapping in which I build together with the dancers, a form of community that unravels the past together to find ways of reclaiming the bodies. Like me, Susanna grew up in Germany with a Polish heritage. This is a hybrid state which partially led us to alienation, but also to the heightened awareness of the maps that define our bodies, but also nations and gender. My research on the complex maps of the human body started with my multimedia project, The Human Anatomy is Adorning Itself, between 2009 and 2011, in which I reflected on the subject of identity and question what a self is, except of its social projections. The textiles in this project function as reflections of the multi-layered skin that stores and erases and creates memories. Throughout the past years, I've carried my research further and treated the act of reclaiming the self as a form of political activism. I shared these uh, workshops in different countries, such as Palestine, where specifically um, the students were actually experiencing this form of um, nations and borders in a very personal and direct way because of the Israeli and Palestine uh, conflict. So in that sense, my personal biography of the Polish and German side has become like a way to uh, teach the generation, the students that are now in the situation uh, to handle basically the subject of trauma. I claim that the understanding of our body maps and cultural maps goes hand in hand with the formation of a self that can resist the forms of manipulation. In such a way, I think even that to understand the impact of trauma on our breathing and respiratory system can be a first act of reclaiming our personal maps that have been dictated by external bodies throughout the history. So my work, past pieces, um, merging with what I call now, 
is like a puzzle piece for an attempt for me to understand the human body and the impact of like external factors throughout history on both the collective on a very personal level. So I, to finish off this short presentation, I was wondering, I don't know if we still have time to show the video or are we good? Uh, how long is the video? Uh, four minutes, but I could also share it as a link in the comments so uh, that people can look at it because that might be easier also. Um, okay, you can, you can do that. And also you can share it on Telegram. That's always a, a way to, um, yeah. and also I think you can also show the video. We have time. Great. schemes and maps ones tailored by those that uh, were one, oh, we don't see the video we only uh, hear it. Mm, let me see i think you have to stop screen sharing and then share uh, the video another again. another window Let's yeah i think i oh, yeah this works Can you see it Mind now? That define yeah. okay. myself. Memories are laying silently in our bones until a sensation awakens them. Collapsing the fragile concept of time and space. past pieces merging with what I call now, imagining what my ancestors' silenced experiences could have sounded like in the words that we share. At times, a memory overwhelmed me in a far from equilibrium manner, as if my ancestors were calling me not to forget in how far they have contributed to the formation of self. My body memorizes the occupation of the lands that you were standing on. Waters dissolving within the development of the globe, announcing a new form of freedom. In the unread footnotes, it was defined as a new form of choreography that equalized the movement of our physiology and psychology to connect us while distancing the relation to ourselves. Printed into an anatomy that is ours are the synchronized gestures that were reformulated in systems of time. Using the same idea of control over those who stand here and those who stand there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Now, uh, thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Uh, you saw maybe in the in the chat we will we were getting a lot of praises uh, for your works, uh, and uh, this just shows how difficult we have it as curators, as we have one hundred and fifty such amazing works. Um, any, um, if you have questions now uh, to address some of the, the, the ideas that came up uh, through the presentations, you can uh, write them in the chat. 
Otherwise, uh, again, I invite you all to join our Telegram group and just have a conversation over there. You can exchange your views, your ideas, your practices uh, with one another. And uh, that's why we find this next museum platform uh, a very, very interesting because it, it creates uh, not only, you know, it's not just curator artist uh, a relationship anymore. It becomes a platform where everyone is, is joining the, the discussion and the exhibition making. Um, so I'm looking at the chat and I actually don't think there are any questions, um, uh, but I do have a question for the three of you, maybe just shortly so that we can then finish on a, on a, on like a question and answer uh, thing. Um, my question is, how did you come to mapping? Uh, why is mapping uh, something that you use in your, in your practice? Who yeah. wants to go first? <laughs> um, so the project I presented today and the practice actually began in my fifth year of architecture. So I, I, I didn't come into arts practice through a traditional route. I studied architecture where, um, map, where I kind of struggled with the idea of mapping because we always map things according to space, but never time. And I think that kind of understanding or that curiosity as to the many different forms of mapping that exist beyond the ones that I was being taught is what kind of initially got me into it. But also the idea that it wasn't like with a project that kind of dealt with botany, it's not just plants that are being categorized and ordered and arranged through the colonial project. It's also space too. And I'm kind of trying to understand what the distinctions between the earth, the underground um, and the cosmos mean or those divisions and lines that we create and those borders that we create and just finding alternative ways of visualizing them and kind of thinking about how, um, how it is not the purpose of a select few to be creating maps. So I think, I think within my practice, I also try and ask who is doing the mapping and and why, which I think is one of your questions. And for me, I believe non-experts are the ones who should be mapping and that maps are not there for truths, are not just there for an aspiration to a truth status, but then, but also there for us to explore like alternative connectivities as well. So for me as being a non-expert in botany, it was a way to ask um, maybe sometimes like naive questions as to like how the plant world is organized and arranged it, as a way to kind of start to think of alternative systems of arranging um, as ones that maybe contradict the way things are currently being done. Um, so that was kind of a long answer, but um, yeah. Yeah, I feel related also partially to that. I mean, mine is maybe also personal in that sense that I grew up in Germany, but we always traveled to Poland and it was as a child already that I was uh, reinforced this concept of borders uh, because at that time the Polish border was also still having controls. So constantly going through these uh, border controls as a child was something where you become aware that there is a separation of some kind, but it's quite abstract. And I think that had a big impact on my identity, but also my practice. Um, and working on top topics with psychology and the constant body map um, and dances also is something which uh, kind of brings me further into these maps as a, as you said, Iman, as a way to ask myself who actually creates these maps, who decides, uh, first of all, who decides the borders or the cartographies, but also who decides uh, what a body basically is and how uh, we claim ourselves basically back this idea and concept of this. So um, I think it's uh, something personal, but also now throughout the years, I've worked a lot with different people who have fled from different countries. And then I become more and more aware how strange the concept of maps is because uh, until now, our recent society, um, there's a very small percentage of people who are in power who decide uh, basically which countries are safe, which countries are uh, in war, and which uh, people therefore basically have to flee. So um, I think it's a very important subject we all have to think about um, 
on the one hand to have the privilege of living in certain maps that are safer on the other hand also to think how such a privilege can be uh, used also to help others monica uh, i'm sorry mateus just we had a question for monica uh you can all read it it says from your perspective does the cartography of the self necessarily match the mapping uh that they inherited or is uh, there space for variations that's a very interesting um, question. I haven't kind of, I thought I wanted to keep the presentation short so I didn't really go into this, but I want to, um, I think for me it's important that trauma in that sense, like for me inherited trauma doesn't necessarily define a destiny of a person. I think that um, in my workshops that I do a lot with dancers, I'm more interested actually of how uh, this inherited trauma may be part of our identity but I like to use the word reclaiming a lot. It's a popular word also in this uh, political context nowadays to basically reclaim the body and the identity as a self as we want it to be um, and as we want to see our gender identity or anything. And um, I gave that example with uh, the breathing. It's kind of, it sounds like a very simple uh, subject, but I think that I've met many people uh, throughout the past years that experienced trauma that are actually quite alienated of their breathing. Uh, so breathing can actually be a form of uh, a first attempt of actually connecting again with the self um, and uh, thereby making more space for something. I think um, that actually what we inherited, the maps that we inherited, we should also be always critical of this. So uh, I don't want to romanticize the idea um, basically of inheriting these things because in parts, especially as a woman, I have learned that it's very important to uh, reflect on basically uh, what are these inherited things and how do they limit my space and then how far do I have to actually free myself through this. So um, yeah, it's, it's important to uh, perceive the identity as something fluid that uh, we also are in power of uh, changing. Thank you, Monica. Um, Matus, we, we still have you to answer the question uh, about why do you use mapping in your in your work? And also I would like, I really like your idea of techno diversity. So if you can also kind of, you know, put that into the answer as well would be amazing. Thank you. Sure. So I think as Iman and Monica have put already, uh, one of my interests in maps is you know, of mapping as a power tool. And I think that's uh, something they already talked about very well. So <laughs> thank you. And, uh, but also uh, I have two other reasons why I started using maps in my practice. My practice. And one was because I can't go anywhere without a map. I'm really, I don't have any sense of space. Um, and that's, something that uh, I feel like um, it restrains me a lot to follow these, especially now with like smart smartphones and GPS, to always follow the most efficient way to one place to another. Uh, and I wanted to try to explore the space in a different way, uh, but without losing this kind of and not the technology. You know, I think we are in a place now that we cannot deny any sort of digital technology because they are everywhere. We need to work with it, maybe against it, but somehow we need to still work with it. Um, and also the, the map for this project, actually, it, it started in a very different uh, perspective where I was researching about skin, skin and the, uh, I don't know the English word for it, but I, I think it's dermatoglyphs, the, the lines that we have in the, the skin. And I wanted to try to create something that would be kind of like this collective skin uh, where these lines could uh, connect each other. Uh, and I started to realize that map or a city is kind of like that is this collective body of lines that are connecting people place and everything that's happening there um, 
And so about techno diversity, this is a term that uh, Yuki Hui uh, develops. And I think it's really interesting, especially uh, being from Brazil, that's not uh, an hegemonic place that technology is created or even uh, for us to have access to uh, certain types of technology, sometimes it's hard or it takes time. Um, and being an artist that works with technology, I know like how hard that can be. Um, and as we look back in the history of man mankind, we can see that uh, we've always been using some sort of technology, you know, uh, so I think it's really interesting to think about the different ways that, that technology could have been developed um, in other places and how it has actually, and we don't know about it. So I think um, techno diversity in a sense is a way to empower these, uh, these other ways of dwelling and these other ways of living. So that's it, thank you. Amazing. Thank you again, everyone. Um, just to sum up, um, I would like to just uh, give an idea of how, through these three uh, presentations, we kind of saw how you know technology can define landscape. On the other hand, how the human and non-human perspective can also be used as a tool for map making. So it is um, a, a topic that is can be uh, addressed from many different perspectives, and I really appreciate everyone's. Um, work that was done in the field. Um, I would also like to thank you guys for presenting uh, today. It was amazing, very well prepared, and we learned something new. Um, and I think we are done. It's uh, almost six o'clock. Uh, if you have uh, more questions, you know, email us. You can uh, reach uh, out through Telegram. Uh, we are uh, open for, you know, conversation, communication, and um, just, you know, stay tuned and follow everything so that you can uh, find out what are the next steps in, in the process. Mm, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And also, if I can uh, say a couple of sentences, if that's OK, Sabina, OK. Um, on Thursday, we have uh, our next tech time. Um, since we already touched uh, the topic of the intersection between art and technology, and this time we will talk about um, art and artificial in intelligence. And it will be with the Paris Collective Obvious. Some of you might know it. and. Um, they actually do create art with artificial intelligence and also with the artist Nora Albadri uh, from Berlin. And she um, yeah, kind of uses AI to question the power structures of Western museums. And at the next take time, she will talk about the activation of artifacts to technology as an emancipatory and decolonial strategy through several artistic intervention, interventions. And I will just post the link in the chat and you can also see it um, on our website. Great. Great. Uh, maybe we can just repost all these links from the chat in, in our Telegram because I feel there were a lot of links that were coming in. Um, okay, thank you everyone and have a nice day, afternoon, evening. We are in so many places around the world. So uh, have a, you know, a nice rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Alina, yes. Do you have access to the chat after the meeting? I think, yeah, I do. Okay. I should okay. have, yes. But um, I, like, I, I just made a suggestion without thinking if that's uh, possible. Yeah, you went, but maybe just to be sure we can copy it as well. But I think it's accessible via Zoom. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, thank you for this.